Hi, Robbie. Bob, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Had a little back surgery recently, but I'm making a good recovery. Oh, you're not going to whine about a little thing like back surgery, are you? <laughs> I'm not whining. I'm not whining. Okay. I'm thanking God. I'm thanking you know, God that they can do these kinds of things. You're known as a conservative thinker, so I don't need to remind you that whining is not what made America great, Robbie. You bet it isn't. So buck up complaining. and get through this conversation. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> so... Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Right Show. You're Robert George. You occupy the very highly esteemed uh, McCormick Professorship of Jurisprudence at Princeton University. You are probably best known beyond academia as a conservative thinker. In fact, I think the New York Times a few years ago called you the most conservative, uh, the, the, the most influential Christian conservative thinker in America. You're, you're Roman Catholic. Um, well, I, uh, since, since I never believe a word the New York Times says, I'm afraid I can't believe that compliment that they paid well, me. I wish I could, but I can't. I admire your consistency. <laughs> I, 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 if in your shoes, might have broken down and uh, <laughs> succumbed to uh, hypocrisy. Um, so, uh, w you know, I wrote you an email a few weeks ago suggesting that we have this talk, and I, I want to quote a little from the email. What I said was that I'm interested in looking at uh, various problems that are facing America, like increased uh, political polarization, uh, and specifically to ask the question of whether uh, we should think of them as not just political problems, but spiritual and moral problems. Um, and that's what I want to do today. I mean, almost everywhere I go, people are talking about this. I was at a dinner last night, and people were like, what's going on in the world? Mm. And always... You know, part of the subtext, at least, when people talk about political polarization or, uh, you know, kind of tribalism in America or whatever, part of the subtext, I think, is Donald Trump. You know, that is that is certainly uh, the most conspicuous manifestation of polarization right now, I guess. But maybe the problem is, is uh, goes beyond him. Uh, and, and I want to hear your views on that. And I want to say, before we get started, that you have a kind of connection to the, the presidential contest, um, you were, I gather, a supporter of Ted Cruz. In any event, you certainly knew him well when he was a student at Princeton. I don't know, is it too much to say that you were a mentor of his, or is that not for you to say? Oh, uh, well, I, I, he has said that I was a mentor of his, and uh, I'm honored that he would say that. Um, he studied with me. I supervised his uh, junior independent paper, and I also supervised his senior thesis, which was a superb uh, analysis of the original understanding of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments uh, to the to the Constitution. Uh, so I've stayed in touch with him uh, over the years. Uh, I was not involved in, a, in any sort of activist role in the campaign, but I did uh, fairly late in the primary uh, process when it was down uh, to just a few candidates, really Kasich, uh, Trump, and Cruz, I did endorse uh, Ted, and I'm, I'm glad I did. It was the right thing to do. Uh, and I'd like to see him, uh, I'd like to see him come back in the future. Now, I'm not pre-endorsing uh, him or anybody else at this point, because I think that uh, the conservative movement has some real stars who could emerge, not only Ted Cruz himself and Marco Rubio, of course, uh, but also Ben Sass from out in uh, Nebraska, who is like myself a, a refusenik when it comes to the Trump uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, Tom Cotton from uh, Arkansas. Uh, there are a number of really uh, terrific young people uh, out there who I think can emerge as uh, leaders of the conservative movement and, depending on what happens uh, to the Republican Party, the Republican Party. But I think the reality is right now, given the Trumpification of the Republican Party, that conservatives might find that they no longer have a home or a secure home in the Republican Party. So we might be looking at a moment, I'm not saying that we are, I'm saying that it's possible that we are, looking at a moment something like uh, what the Whig Party uh, was looking at in the uh, early 1850s when the Republicans emerged from the conscience wing of the uh, of, of the Whig Party. It's a very interesting moment in American politics, and especially for conservatives. Because mm -hmm. Trump's not one. I mean, that's the basic truth of the matter. Uh, Trump has been a Democrat for most of his life. He's been a liberal for most of his life. Uh, he signs on to very little uh, in the traditional uh, Republican uh, agenda. It certainly does not sign on for uh, limited government. Uh, he does not sign on for uh, economic uh, freedom. Uh, I suspect far from reducing uh, the uh, scope of uh, the executive branch's power, he would further expand it at the um, at the um, expense of the legislative branch. So there are a whole lot a whole lot of ways in which 
Trump has never been and certainly is not now a conservative. Uh, and if he is what the Republican Party now becomes, then conservatives are going to need to find another home. And so I gather that is at the heart of your refused Nickism. I mean, you, you've just told us uh, essentially why it is you, you couldn't support Trump. And the reason I ask is because to some people, uh, he has a repugnance that goes beyond ideology, you know, just kind of yeah, the sure. kind of person he is. Um, w w what do you... Oh, oh, well, I mean, it certainly doesn't help at all that he's a braggart, uh, an oaf, uh, a buffoon, uh, his uh, rather uh, gross prejudices against Muslims and, uh, and others are evident. I don't know that he actually has those prejudices, to tell you the truth, but he's willing to pretend that he does to appeal to the worst uh, in, uh, in people and, and, I have to say, in some of my uh, fellow uh, conservatives. So all that's very bad. Of course, his personal history, uh, the, uh, his misogyny, the way he has uh, uh, cashed in wives for, for new, sleeker, younger, more attractive models, uh, his uh, confessed and, and, and bragged about, boasted about uh, adulteries, uh, his reference uh, to women in um, you know, just horribly uh, sexual uh, terms. Uh, all of that, frankly, disgusts me and would make me very make it very difficult, frankly, for me to support him, even if I felt that he was uh, right on the issues. But on top of all his other defects, he's wrong on the issues. Now, having said all that, uh, I don't find any virtue or superiority in Hillary Clinton. So I am a man without a political home or country uh, just at the moment. And I'm not alone in this, as you know, uh, as you know, Bob, there are a lot of people who are strong, uh, what we might call civil society conservatives. What a civil society conservative is, or what a contemporary modern American conservative of my ilk, is really an old-fashioned liberal, an old-fashioned Madisonian, Tocquevillian, uh, Lincolnian uh, liberal, someone who believes that uh, government really has a subsidiary role to play, an important role, but a subsidiary role, and that we can't get government back into its own place until we revitalize the institutions of civil society. But to do that, we have to make sure that government doesn't enervate, doesn't uh, undermine the authority or the autonomy of the institutions of civil society, beginning with the marriage-based family, but including the church, the other religious community, the civil civic association, the neighborhood association, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, civic associations of every uh, sort, the non-governmental institutions that do the primary work of providing health, education, and welfare, which when they fail or when they're pushed to the side, uh, those jobs, those tasks, that mission has to be taken over by government, who will do it poorly, as the evidence shows, uh, leading to the kind of uh, problems in many of our poorer and most vulnerable, commun vulnerable communities that we have today. I don't see Trump helping in, in that respect at all. Whatever Trump is, even if in some loose, very loose sense you could call him a conservative, he's not a civil society conservative. Okay. And how, uh, how much is your civil society conservatism intertwined, if at all, with your religious background? I mean, I, I, you know, if the government's not going to provide these services, the question arises as to who will. Certainly, uh, religious organizations have traditionally played a role there. Uh, yeah, uh, Tocqueville pointed this out um, even as early as the 1830s, you know, when he came to our country originally to, to look at the prison system, uh, but found himself fascinated by the way democracy worked here. Uh, constitutional democracy, uh, a republican form of government, uh, but also especially fascinated by the role of religion. Here we were, a country where there was no established religion, and yet religion flourished in a way that it didn't in old Europe, where he came from, that had established religions. And the multiplicity of sects, far from undermining the influence and importance of religion or its role in civil society, seemed to support uh, a more robust role uh, for religion in uh, in civil society. Uh, now, I think, as you know, Bob, I'm not myself a strict libertarian by any means. Uh, my, libertarians and I are friendly critics of, uh, of each other. Uh, and that's because I don't think that the, that the state has just no role, even in the provision of social services, especially when it comes to the, uh, to the safety net. Uh, I do think there's a role, especially when it comes to the, uh, 
last resort safety net uh, for uh, for government. But I'm worried that government has gotten too big, too intrusive, uh, and has enervated the institutions of civil society by pushing them out of their health, education, and welfare uh, roles or commandeering them to serve the uh, interests and goals of the um, of the state itself. So yes, I think religion has a very important uh, role to play, but not any one particular religion. As it happens, I myself am a Catholic, but I think that all the different uh, faiths have a very important role to play for people within their communities. And in most cases, most religions want to extend their hand of, of care and concern to people outside of their own faiths, which I think is, is terrific. So I would like to see religion uh, restored to its Tocquevillian uh, role in providing um, social services, but that can't be an exclusive role, not for any one religion, not for religion generally. There are non-religious institutions of civil society that play an important role, and the government does have a role to play beyond just providing, as the libertarians would have it, policing and a military. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are, you're not signing up for the uh, Gary Johnson <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, not only am I not signing up as a civil society conservative for Gary Johnson, if I were a libertarian, I would not sign up for Gary Johnson because whatever that guy is, it turns out he's not a libertarian. Uh, I, I saw one great uh, tweet um, on, on, on Twitter. It was a great quip that the libertarians this year have their big chance. All they needed to do was nominate a libertarian, and they failed to do it. What, what's his biggest departure from true libertarianism? Oh, I think probably the biggest is his idea that there's no such thing as religious liberty. I mean, that's just crazy. Uh, the, his, yeah. Well, uh, that's his, probably not the way he'd put it. But, you, but, but, but you're referring to, for example, whether uh, the, the issue of whether if somebody, if you're a baker and somebody orders a birth, uh, cake for a gay wedding and so on. If that you're type a baker, of, the, yeah. the Obama uh, abortifacient and uh, contraceptive mandate or, I mean, he, he really spoke very broadly. He said, you know, the trouble with religious liberty is that if people are allowed to pick and choose the laws that they obey, then uh, we'll have anarchy. It's very interesting to have a libertarian uh, complaining or warning about the prospects of, uh, of anarchy. But he seemed to find no place at all where claims of religious liberty against state imposition had any purchase uh, for him. So you can look at that and you can look at other areas. Uh, you know, he, uh, he certainly is not in the mainstream of libertarianism when it comes to issues of of uh, government intervention in climate issues and all that kind of uh, all that kind of stuff, uh, I think I think if the libertarians really did uh, nominate this year a a principled, credible libertarian, um, they'd have a shot not at at winning the presidency, but as, as establishing themselves as a very credible, permanent third party along the lines of what you traditionally had in Britain say with what used to be known as the Liberal Party. So you had Labour and you had the Tories, but you had a strong Liberal Party. Now you have a, a, a decent, a decently strong Social Democratic Party as an alternative to Labour and, um, uh, and the Tories. And I think you could have had something similar to that with the Libertarian Party starting uh, this year. But of course, you know, there are, a lot, there are lots of problems with, with Johnson, you know, his own you know, personal involvement with uh, with marijuana. It's one thing to be an advocate of drug legalization because you think, well, you know, uh, prohibition has uh, more yeah. more costs than benefits. It does more harm than good. You know, all the arguments that were made against alcohol uh, prohibition. It's another thing to be you know, involved in the industry, to be a personal user, to boast about your personal use, your recreational use of cannabis, and and so forth. It just it just I think uh, diminished his credibility and wiped out the possibility that libertarianism would in this election emerge as a true, important, substantial, regular third party in American politics. Okay. It's too bad, too, because while I'm not a libertarian, I've got a lot of respect for libertarianism. Okay. So I'm going to put you down. <laughs> no, for Johnson, <laughs> in addition to Trump and Hillary. No, and I don't think I'm going to spend any time asking you about Jill Stein. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, my dear friend and good pal, um, Cornell West yep. has endorsed uh, uh, Jill Stein, and and I want to say more power to him. I mean, if I were on the left, uh, as Cornell is, of course, yep. um, I hope that I would have the integrity uh, to um, not just get on board the Clinton bandwagon, but to support an honest uh, leftist uh, like Jill Stein uh, rather than 
sign on with uh, a dishonest uh, person uh, like Hillary Clinton. It, it's the reason. It's the same reason I'm not endorsing Trump. I um, mean, I'm not just going to get on the bandwagon as so many other people have, saying, you know, well, you know, he he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB uh, right. to speak in very Trumpian terms. Right. Um, or, you know, we have to we have to circle the wagons around the party, no matter how bad this guy uh, this guy is. I think at some point we have to have the integrity to say, I'm not going along with the party. It's what I and my fellow refuseniks are saying in the Republican Party about Trump, and it's what Cornell. And a very few others on the left are saying about Clinton, but God bless him. And unsurprising, if you know Cornell, you know what a man of principle he is. I, I do. Know Unsurprisingly, Cornell. he's refusing to get on that Clinton bandwagon, even after Bernie Sanders, whom he ardently supported, decided to endorse Clinton. Cornell called him up, said, "Bernie, I can't go along with you on this. I'm out the door. I'm supporting uh, Jill Stein." That that. It was completely predictable if you know Cornell. It was exactly the right thing to do. And uh, I just uh, just further heightens my respect for him. Mm -hmm. And we should maybe say, by, uh, lest anyone uh, stereotype you as a narrow-minded uh, conservative that Cornell currently has an affiliation at your uh, – the Madison Institute, is it, at, at Princeton, the Madison – well, yes, I have the honor to be the director. I was the founder and am the director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions uh, at Princeton. Uh, we have a bit of a reputation for being a conservative uh, program. We try to not be ideological or doctrinaire. We uh, uh, offer uh, lectures and uh, panelists and so forth from a wide spectrum of positions. Uh, we we had uh, Justice, the late Justice Scalia visit our program, but we also had Justice uh, Breyer and so forth. But I'm uh, delighted to say that uh, Professor West is a visiting professor this year, his job this year, actually. He's a visiting professor in the James Madison program at Princeton. I couldn't be more delighted uh, to have him. And everyone associated with our program is delighted to have him and honored to have him. And we might as well also say that until he had that position, he was right next door to me here at Union Theological <laughs> Seminary. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, you know, Cornell and I have continued to teach together, even uh, uh, though he had moved up uh, to where you are at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, he uh, would come back every other year or so to uh, teach a seminar that he and I offer together, uh, which we uh, call Adventures in Ideas, which is really a kind of great books uh, seminar. We typically begin uh, reading Sophocles, uh, the Antigone. Uh, we always read a couple of dialogues of Plato's. Uh, we introduce our students to St. Augustine. Uh, we uh, writers from Machiavelli to Marx, uh, John Stuart Mill to C.S. Lewis, uh, uh, Martin Buber, uh, Antonio Gramsci, a real spectrum of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of thinkers. And we try to treat these thinkers not as um, items in a museum, but as people who have something to say to us today, who have something uh, for us to engage, us being ourselves and our students, uh, to engage uh, today. So we try to talk about issues of our own time and not just the issues that were particularly salient in their time. Mm -hmm. Salient in their time, I should say. Well, maybe I should, uh, if you ever teach a seminar again, maybe I should audit it. I could, I could use a little <laughs> remedial education. So uh, you, you suggested early on that uh, maybe the Republican Party is not going to emerge from all this as anything like what it was before. In other words, we may be, uh, we may be headed for a true political party realignment. Where the it's parties... been a long time since it's happened, but political parties are not uh, written on the on the 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 Ten Commandments. You know, it doesn't yeah. say there shall be a Democratic Party or there shall be a Republican Party. It's been a long time since we had a new party, uh, and it might be that now is the time when it happens. When it happens, it will be something like this that causes it uh, it to happen. Yeah. And the, the 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 example I used and will mention again is you know the Republicans replacing the Whigs. Right. And when you, when you say this, I, I think an interesting question is, what is the this? What's ultimately driving this? I mean, if this happens in decades from now, historians will find deep structural things that were changing and they will attribute the yep. alignment to that. I mean, some obvious issues are things like immigration. Uh, there are, I think, technological things that have certainly influenced the tenor of uh, political discourse. Uh, and there are various other forces afoot. There's, uh, you know, there's globalization. And some people have characterized this as a kind of a 
nationalist versus kind of globalist cosmopolitan uh, tension uh, with, with Trump clearly uh, occupying the nationalist role. What do you identify as, as, as kind of the ultimate causes of this? I don't think that there is an ultimate cause, and I um, think that it's a mistake to suppose in advance that there is, and then to go looking for it. Now, I think that there's some element of truth, uh, exactly what it is and, and how much it accounts for the overall phenomena I think we could uh, discuss and explore. Mm -hmm. There's some element in truth, of truth in all of the uh, issues and factors that, that you raised, immigration, technological development, globalization. Uh, all of those things and uh, and more. But here's the thing, Bob, and this takes us a little bit into the uh, abstract area of the philosophy of the social sciences. What will happen in the future is social scientists will look back and they'll give some causal explanation of why it happened, which will be modeled on the natural sciences. Uh, the pre presupposition will be whatever happened happened because it had to happen because certain forces lined up and factors were in place that made it happen people at the time didn't realize that it had to happen or why it was happening or to some extent that it was happening but it was happening and it had to happen the way it happened because it was all in the cards I think that too is a fundamental mistake social phenomena historical phenomena are the products of many things but including one of the things that is included is human deliberation judgment and choice and that introduces an element of freedom and contingency into human affairs that social scientists <clears throat> tend to overlook because they make the mistake of trying to model their mode of inquiry on the natural sciences they want to try to make political science or sociology or economics a real quote science unquote in the way that chemistry uh, or physics or biology is a real uh, uh, science but remember human affairs include freedom of the will human affairs include contingency that's introduced by people doing things that they didn't have to do it was not inevitable that Donald Trump would emerge or would say the things he said, or take the, posi take the positions he's taken, or ignite the fires, or have the appeal, or any of that stuff. Part of that was free decisions on his part. Part of, it, part of it was free decisions on the parts of lots of other people who are involved as his supporters, or, or what have you, or people who react to him, even if they react to him from a certain negative uh, point of view, or what have you. So I think we should be skeptical of uh, the idea that what's happening is happening because of structural factors or forces, social forces that are really beyond anybody's control and are making the inevitable happen. We need to be cognizant of the contingency of human affairs. One way to think about this that I think illustrates my point is if you write Winston Churchill out of the picture, things don't come out the way they did come out in 1945. It very easily could have happened that England was occupied or surrendered in 1939 or 1940, mm -hmm. and it's a different world. You write Lincoln out of the picture, or you replace Lincoln with Stephen Douglas in 1860, or some other aspirant, presidential aspirant in, in uh, 1860, I think you get a different result. Mm -hmm. You might have two countries. The, the, the human affairs are shot through with contingency and that makes it impossible for social science to be a science in the same sense that the natural sciences are a end of end of sermon but yeah I although I would say uh, I'd say a couple of things um, one is a footnote that we can pass over quickly I think I mean even in in the case of biological ev evolution there is contingency in the sense that uh, <clears throat> You know, uh, but for a, a roll of the dice, uh, the human species might look different or it might have been wiped out. Now, my own view is that even if it had been wiped out, probably the niche of intelligent life, something like ours, would have ultimately be, been filled. Uh, I mean, what I'd say is kind of in the cards in biological evolution is things like certain properties, certain uh, technology, so to speak, like flight has been independently invented many times. Eyesight has been independently invented. So there are there are kind of things that that uh, 
generically speaking, you, ex you would expect to emerge eventually from natural selection. At the same time, the path of any particular species, you know, asteroid hits the Earth and all bets are off for a while. And so, so that's a footnote, but more to, to the point, I guess, and, and by way of clarifying, I, I'd say two things. I mean, you've used the word contingency a couple of times. By that, you don't mean just randomness, I think. I, I think oh, you, no, no, I think no, you no, meant, I mean yeah, I mean you mean freedom. freedom. There's enough sense, of, I mean, contingency is sometimes used to meet, refer to random influence, but I think you mean that there is enough sensitivity to key interventions that human agency can be one of those decisive <clears throat> interventions and in, in a very consequential one. Exactly right. And it's not mere randomness because the people who perform the acts that make the difference in history and society perform those acts for reasons. Now, they're not forced to, right, because determinism is false. They're not forced to do it. it, it nothing in uh, the chemical makeup of Winston Churchill uh, uh, forced him to give the blood, sweat, and tear speech. He gave it for reasons that seemed to him to be good and sound reasons, and it made a a big difference. So when I say contingency, I'm really talking about human rational freedom. I'm not talking about uh, stochastic or random sorts of events, although it's also true, and, and here's where your footnote comes in, uh, and I agree with the footnote, by the way. Uh, it, it is also true that there are, in addition to everything else in the picture, random and stochastic events, uh, the uh, uh, lightning strikes here rather than there, the asteroid uh, hits the Earth, uh, those kinds of things figure in it too. But all of this goes to show you that any explanation of especially large scale human and therefore social phenomena, any explanation is going to have to be very, very complex. Sure. And, you know, there are the well-known problems with testing theories in any historical science and the study of human affairs is ultimately an historical science. Um, yeah. the, the, uh, so, uh, but I would argue that it's possible on the one hand to leave room for human agency, but to believe that kind of the, uh, the challenges posed to human agency are the result of deep structural forces. So to take the current example, I, I would think that given technological evolution and a certain, a certain part of that seems more or less inexorable, that communications technologies will advance, for example, and so on. Oh, I would, oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so I, I would see say, where you're going. I would yeah, say, yeah, I would say I given agree. that, you are likely to get nations more and more interconnected. You are likely to get specific uh, populations within given nations, like let's take elites or elites of a certain kind, business elites or something. You are like, likely to see them get more and more interconnected with their counterparts in other nations and find that they have common interests and so on. You are likely to find other groups in America who don't feel that commonality with foreigners and indeed might for very, you know, might even find foreigners threatening, might or might not. But in any event, a certain kind of tension between globalism or internationalism and some alternative to that, it seems to me was kind of a likely thing to develop. And that is posing us with issues that I, I certainly agree uh, I mean, I consider deep moral challenges. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's why I said earlier, Bob, that all of those factors and forces that you uh, uh, mentioned in introducing uh, this topic are part of it. They play a role. The, expl the complete explanation cannot factor them out either. My only point was they cannot provide the complete explanation because of human freedom and the contingency that it introduces. But I think that those factors need to be taken seriously. And one of them certainly is globalization, including the sense of um, not just business, but uh, intellectual and other elites, that they form an international community uh, that um, is uh, reshaping the world away from the sort of Westphalian idea of of uh, independent uh, nation states. But lots of non-elites, plus a few elites who are themselves still tied uh, for one reason or another, uh, so some reasons which in my view are pretty good, uh, to the idea of uh, national uh, allegiances. Uh, Brexit uh, in England uh, reflects that. To some extent, the Trump phenomenon uh, here reflects that. But of course, it's, it's mixed in, the Trump phenomenon here and the Brexit phenomenon, with immigration issues, right. with uh, certain religious issues uh, having to do with influxes of uh, Muslims 
uh, into historically Christian nations like Britain and, uh, and, and the United States. It's a much bigger issue, of course, in Britain than it is uh, in the United States. Uh, all of that, I think, has got to be taken into account, and it's all important. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you look at what Trump appealed to, there were reasons for why he chose those things. It's the reasons why he chose the immigration issue, for example. There are reasons why he chose the attack on trade, free trade, international uh, uh, free trade. There was clearly a dislocation. There was clear, clearly and is and has been for some time a feeling of great anxiety uh, among people who are in the most vulnerable sectors of uh, American industry, people whose jobs really are being shipped uh, overseas where cheaper, uh, sometimes exploited, uh, labor uh, is, uh, is available. Uh, all of that is, is true, and it's, it's part of the picture. Mm -hmm. And you see here natural tension within conservatism, at least as broadly construed, because there is, and this has been much discussed, but there is Burkean conservatism, which, which yeah. puts a lot of emphasis on tradition and kind of caution about change and caution about changing values and so on. And then it's kind of like Adam Smith yeah. conservatism, which emphasizes the virtues of free trade. And these just obviously uh, come into tension. And, and uh, I would think you probably identify to some extent, at least, with both of these schools. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, well, that's right. There's no one conservatism. You know, just as there's no one liberalism, there's no one socialism for that matter, uh, there's no one conservatism. And the Burkean strains of contemporary conservatism are present along with the, uh, the more libertarian or uh, not, not using it in a standard political sense now, but progressive ideas about, uh, about conservatism. Uh, there's the kind of um, conservatism that I identified myself with earlier, which is really an old-fashioned liberalism, the liberalism of Madison and, uh, and Tocqueville uh, and Lincoln, people like that. Uh, and to some extent, American, mainstream American conservatism is an amalgam of those. And now, under certain sorts of pressures, it's probably true that you're seeing cracks develop between the competing schools. Now, those cracks were never completely obscure. It's, they were always there. For example, the difference between the neoconservatism represented by people like Irving Kristol and Richard John Newhouse and the paleoconservatism of people like uh, Patrick Buchanan and Joe Sobrand with somebody as central as William F. Buckley really kind of straddling the two, probably leaning a little more toward neoconservatism and away from paleoconservatism. So, you know, Joe Sobrand gets excommunicated from National Review. Uh, 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 Pat Buchanan is placed in the wilderness by uh, William, F., uh, William F. Buckley. So Buckley, when forced uh, to sort of lean one way or another, leaned toward neoconservatism. But my point is that those differences or those tensions, those cracks have been there all along, but the pressures of the current moment, I think, are making them a lot more evident. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain amount of <clears throat> sympathy I'm seeing among uh, some paleoconservatives for some elements of Trumpism. There, there, there's oh, yeah. definitely, I mean, oh, Pat, 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 Pat Buchanan's appeal kind of foreshadowed a certain amount of the Trumpism. You know, there's a nativism and a and a protectionism and so on. Um, That's right. Now, this story, this tune has been, this song has been being sung by Pat Buchanan for some time. Right. Anti-immigration, uh, uh, anti-trade, uh, favoring protectionism, all that stuff. I mean, that was that was right there in, in the Buchanan campaigns in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain market for it then. Now, that market seems to have expanded or Trump has expanded it. I'm not sure which was the chicken and which was the egg. Uh, but it it uh, it has definitely grown, and it's not just Buchanan. Uh, before her uh, death recently, the late Phyllis Schlafly uh, embraced uh, Trump. Now her organization tried to actually remove her from leadership because of that, because so many people in her own organization were opposed to Trump. But there, that shows you right there, mm -hmm. uh, even within what perhaps credibly could have been called a, a paleocon uh, organization, the Schlafly organization, even there, you've got this fracture mm -hmm. within it. Now, there's a part of your background uh, that I, we haven't talked about here, but is relevant to all this. I think you grew up in West Virginia. Your grandfather was a coal miner. You know, Trump's appeal uh, is said to uh, lie geographically in part 
you know, in Appalachia, or at least yeah, a- 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 Appalachia is said to kind of crystallize in a way That's right. uh, the appeal. And I'm wondering if your manifest familiarity with the region gives you uh, any kind of particular perspective on all this. Uh, this is the first time in my life that I can recall where I have been strongly alienated uh, from my native culture uh, in Appalachia. I, I've always considered myself first and foremost to be an Appalachian. And uh, you know, my values were really shaped uh, by, uh, by the culture uh, of, uh, of Appalachia. Appalachia is Trump country. And um, I, I'm, just not, I'm just not with that program. But I can understand why Appalachia is Trump country. And it really is Trump country. If you drive through uh, West Virginia, Southern Ohio, Southeastern uh, Pennsylvania, Eastern Kentucky, you drive through there, you're not going to see a Clinton sign anywhere. And during the primaries, you weren't seeing cruise signs uh, or Rubio signs. I mean, that is Trump country. Now, why is it Trump country? There, the big issue is not immigration, believe me. Uh, there, the big issue really is trade and economic dislocation and the sense that nobody is speaking for us for what um, the, um, the excellent uh, political commentator Michael Barone calls the Jacksonians, you know, the old, um, uh, the old uh, uh, sort of uh, people of Scotch-Irish uh, heritage. That doesn't happen to be my own people. My, my people were immigrants uh, there in my grandfather's uh, generation. Both of them came over, one from Syria, one from uh, Italy, uh, and uh, ended up working in the mines. My paternal grandfather for his entire life on the mines and in the railroads. My maternal grandfather saved up enough money working in the mines to get out of the mines and to establish a little uh, little grocery business. But of course, most of our neighbors were of that Scotch-Irish stock. They really were the, uh, the Jacksonians, as Barone calls them. Uh, and they are feeling extremely vulnerable. Uh, they've seen wage stagnation or worse, a loss of jobs. Uh, they've seen a an eight-year assault on the uh, on the coal uh, industry, which has, has been devastating for West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, Southern uh, Ohio, uh, they feel that they are uh, not only not valued but held in contempt. They believe that they are the last people against whom uh, prejudices are permissible. You can still laugh at them. You can make jokes about them. You can treat them with contempt. Uh, you can call them rednecks. There's an excellent book uh, by a writer who comes from there named J.D. Vance called Hillbilly Elegy. And although it's not about Trump, if you want to understand the Trump phenomenon, especially in this core constituency of his in Appalachia, I urge your viewers uh, to look at J.D. Vance's book, Hillbilly uh, Elegy. When you understand why these people uh, resonate uh, to... um, attacks on free trade, which has shipped their jobs away, uh, attacks on uh, political correctness or assaults on political uh, correctness of which they perceive themselves to be uh, victims, uh, then you'll begin to understand why Trump has the appeal. Mm -hmm. And if you could go back there and talk to people, maybe some of whom you actually, you know, are friends you're still in touch with or relatives or whatever, uh, or people you don't know there, what would you say to them about why you think their support for Trump is misplaced? Well, I was back there recently, as a matter of fact, to attend a, um, a high school uh, event. I was, I was inducted into my high school hall of fame. Congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank maybe you. Th- maybe they honor, didn't. Actually, of all, the, of, all, of all the various honors I've Even after you came out percent. against Trump, they still gave you that? Yeah, they still gave me that. I think, that, I think they probably voted on it before uh, they realized I was anti-Trump. Uh, but I was back there and, uh, uh, you know, I tried not to be too provocative in talking to my old uh, friends, some of whom I hadn't seen for 40 years. Uh, and I do, I do appreciate why they support Trump, but I don't want to be condescending toward them. Uh, and I, um, I, I certainly don't believe that they're idiots for doing it, and I certainly don't believe that they're ill-motivated. And when I consider Hillary Clinton, I really understand uh, why they are looking for any alternative they can find. But in those conversations, the most painful thing to me, and they were too polite to say it, but I could tell, is they had the sense that I had gone off and I had made it. I'm an Ivy League professor who has a kind of a national platform and they see my name in the papers and they see that I've won this award or published this or that or the other thing. And I 
I have no doubt they have the sense that I don't see things the way they see things anymore. And since I have entered the elite culture, I've left my home culture behind and I've lost the sense of how bad things are for people there and how badly they need someone like Trump providing a voice for them. I'll, I'll tell you that, frankly, that hurts. Uh, you know, I don't want to whine. I'm a conservative. We're against whining, as you, <laughs> as, as you say. But, but I, 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 I think that's not true, and I hope that that's not true. And I have never considered myself or felt in the slightest to be alienated uh, from, uh, from my culture until, uh, until this election. And um, I'm just not on board uh, with Trump. So, you know, the, the, the case I make is that Trump is not being square with you. Trump is not being honest with you until yesterday virtually. He was opposed to everything he says he's now for, and he was for everything he's now saying he's opposed to. Uh, the people in Appalachia like the fact that he's a social conservative. Well, I'm a social conservative too, and I'd love our presidential uh, nominee and our president to be a social conservative. But Trump's just fooling people. He's not a social conservative. He hasn't lived the life of a social conservative, and until what a year ago or two years ago, his, his advocacy and his own philanthropy was anything but socially conservative. Uh, this this business with Muslims, which is not a big issue in in Appalachia because the you know the uh, the um, uh, immigration isn't uh, isn't there. This is not uh, something that uh, that Trump was concerned about until he found that it could be a useful uh, political issue for him. The same thing with with trade. Uh, so my, that's what I say to them. What what they say to me in a very polite way. Uh, is uh, you've become an elitist. You've gone over to the other side. What I say to them is this man is tricking you. He's fooling you. Please don't fall for it. This is a mistake. Yes, you, there are real problems we have in our in, in our culture in Appalachia. If you've, if you've read the recent work, Bob, by um, Bob Putnam at Harvard, by Charles Murray, by David and Amber Lapp on the collapse of the, uh, of the white working class, the culture of the white working class, uh, not only in the old Rust Belt cities, you know, the South Bend, Indiana's and Akron's and so forth, but also in, um, in rural areas like Appalachia, you realize that there are very serious problems. J.D. Vance in his book goes into this in detail. He himself grew up in that culture in a very dysfunctional uh, family among many dysfunctional uh, families. So the book tells you all about it. I have more than sympathy for that. I mean, I'm gravely, deeply concerned about it. We need to do something, uh, both for our minority and our non-minority populations that are caught in this downward spiral that that Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, pointed to in 1965 when it came to African American communities, and which we've now seen replicated across the board uh, among uh, uh, lower middle class and poor. Uh, people. But Trump is not the solution to this. He is not going to solve these problems. We need a serious effort on behalf of those who are suffering from economic dislocation, those who are mired in poverty, and some of the contemporary cultural pathologies that are associated with, with poverty. But Trump's not going to do anything. But, about but I assume it wouldn't be mainly a federal government effort that's required from, from, from the point of view of your own ideology, right? Uh, no, it's not mainly. I think there is a role for the federal government to play. It's not mainly a federal government. In fact, it's not mainly a governmental issue. Local government, too, has a role. I think a bigger government, a bigger role, state and local government, than the than the federal uh, uh, government. But it's ma mainly, Bob, an issue of revitalizing the institutions of civil society so that they can uh, do their jobs. Uh, Nicholas Kristof wrote a very interesting, he's not somebody I generally agree with, you know, the writer for the, mm -hmm. uh, the op-ed writer for the New York Times. Uh, not somebody I generally agree with, but uh, I want to say a year and a half, maybe two years ago, he wrote a very interesting column after visiting Appalachia, I think, as I, if I recall correctly, went to West Virginia. And uh, he talked very candidly in the, uh, in the article, which you can Google, uh, about the way in which um, uh, well-intentioned uh, federal anti-poverty programs often had the perverse effect of, um, of uh, uh, creating or entrenching uh, dependency and other uh, social pathologies. And he said in the column, I as a liberal find it very tough to admit this, but you know, having examined the situation, having been there, having talked to people, I can see that it's in, in fact true. So part of what uh, we need from the federal government is a do no harm policy. Uh, but there's work for every level, both governmental and non-governmental, when it comes to addressing the very serious problems 
that uh, working class, or alas, so often now formerly working class people, formerly because they're no longer working, and poor people are experiencing it. I mean, I, if, if, if being a conservative means you don't care about poor people, then I'm not a conservative. But of course, I don't think that's what conservatism means. Uh, I, I think we, it's fundamental, I mean, I'm also a Christian, I think we fundamentally have to be concerned about poor people. In fact, our primary concern should be for the least, the last, uh, the, uh, the lost. Uh, but, um, um, it's a, jo- it's a, it's a Herculean task that every level of government and society has to play its role to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And I guess one complication is that, uh, in, in terms of civil society, of course, the robustness of the religious institutions that have traditionally played a role, uh, has declined yeah. and not entirely. I think even you would agree because of government, you know, intervention. Yeah. government yeah. intervention. Um, and in fact, one of the kind of surprises of Trump is how successful uh, a guy uh, who is pretty obviously not very religious, if he's in fact religious at all, uh, how successful he can be in the Republican primary and how little the, uh, you know, the, the and, and in this very part of the country I'm sensing, in Appalachia, a certain amount of his support comes from people who are, who are not terribly uh, religious. But in any event, you know, the churches aren't what they used to be there, right? Yeah, that's true, and uh, that's that's true in poor communities in urban areas uh, as well. Uh, you know, the, the the church has been hurt as much as everyone else, and some of those wounds are self-inflicted. Uh, you know, that's true of the Catholic Church. That's uh, uh, true of a lot of evangelical churches. That's uh, that's true of uh, some of the black churches. I mean, it's just true across the board. And churches need to get their own act together. When I say everybody has a role to play here, churches have a crucial role to play. But that's going to mean pulling themselves back together and uh, you know, getting getting straightened up and uh, uh, eliminating in some cases the, the corruption that goes on uh, within the church, sometimes involving uh, government money, uh, for example. So there's an awful lot of work to do uh, at all levels. But religion has a crucial role uh, to, to play here. In some areas, religion is at the churches or religious institutions are pretty much all that's left to sort of maintain what is left of civil uh, society. Uh, in some poor white communities, that's true. In some urban poor black communities and Hispanic communities, uh, that's true. It's still true, as my uh, friend Pastor Eugene Rivers of the Church of God in Christ says, that that the um, that the church is still the sovereign institution uh, of Black America. Uh, there's something similar to be said about uh, the churches uh, uh, in Appalachia. So you know they've got to they've got to pull their uh, uh, their their weight in this and. Um, a lot of them are not in a condition right now, Bob, to do it. Mm-hmm. That means they're going to have to get into condition to do it. Okay, and they're going to have to cooperate. By the way, that's the other thing. I mean, <laughs> for all the theological differences they have, you know, between the Catholics and the Protestants and the the Reformed and the uh, and uh, the, the the Lutherans and everybody else, uh, you know, they're just going to have to, when it comes to uh, moral life, to cultural life. Uh, to to the provision of social services, to 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 trying to get people back on their feet. When it comes to making moral demands on people who are the beneficiaries uh, of uh, of uh, of charity, which is important part of the part of the equation, uh, the churches are going to have to work together. They're going to have to lay those theological differences aside and really work together. Mm-hmm. And you know, just briefly speaking of uh, common denominators of otherwise diverse uh, Christians, you know, I have. Uh, uh, a member of my uh, immediate family uh, is an evangelical Christian, and to judge by her Facebook uh, posts, is going to vote for Trump. And uh, a question I I would be tempted to ask her if I if I did weren't wise enough to just not bring the subject up at all. <laughs> it's just like you know you're you're I'm sure you're familiar with the famous uh, his famous mocking of a disabled person. Trump's yeah. uh, mocking of a di- is is kind of like my question is. Uh, how can you call yourself a Christian and vote for someone who would mock a disabled person? I mean, it seems to me if you get all the different kinds of Christians in the world together and, and you could probably get them to agree on one thing that is incompatible with Christian virtues, right? Yeah, don't mock a disabled person. No, really. Don't mock a disabled person. Yeah, there's been some effort recently. I mean, I have criticized him ferociously for, for mocking that disabled reporter. I, I have noticed recently that uh, there's an organization, I think it's called Catholics for Trump, that is making an argument based on the 
the complete uh, videotape that Trump, in fact, did not mock uh, the disabled. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't buy it. But we need. Did you, to did you look at the video? I mean, it. It. it I'm a look at their it's... video, but you, I've looked. You... I've seen the video of Trump doing it. And I've seen. The no, reporter. no, we've seen the video of Trump. Yeah. But anyway, this. This. I'm not. Believe me, I'm not defending Trump. Yeah. But I'm trying to take on board all the right. relevant information. Right. And this. This group's got a video of the complete speech, and he does a similar uh, distorting uh, motion when he mocks Ted Cruz in the same speech, just, just moments before turning to the reporter, uh, he mocks Ted Cruz and he mocks one of his other critics or opponents with a similar gesture, which leads to the inference that he wasn't actually making that motion as a mockery of that reporter's disability. I, I don't know, you can argue. Whether he did or didn't, he has done so many dreadful, appalling things. He has said so many dreadful, appalling things. His ref references to women as pieces of, you know what, uh, his, uh, his claim that John McCain was not a war hero, that he favors people who did not get caught and sent to uh, prison camps, uh, uh, his, his, his uh, uh, bigoted statements about the Mexican judge and the inability of the judge to be impartial because of his Mexican. I mean, you, and, and, and then everything else that you've got in the man's background uh, gives you good grounds for giving him very little benefit of the doubt, even when it comes to mocking yeah. the reporter. So even if you factor out the mocking of the reporter, the man is what I said earlier he is. He's a buffoon. He's an oaf. Um, he is the very opposite of a gentleman, I'm afraid. Yeah, so y you, you said there you're trying to take all information on board. Um, and I would say that's not a very common practice these days in, in America. And that leads to a kind of a, a generic problem that is larger than Trump. It, it has to do with just kind of tribalization, oh, uh, broadly yeah. speaking. Uh, you see it in the world broadly sectarian, nationalistic, but also just ideological and socioeconomic tribalization. And this precedes Trump. And some people have attributed to it to technology, you know, and I think there is something there, the way information technologies allow you to kind of cocoon yourself with like-minded people. I think you have to also factor in the human mind and the way the mind in some ways does uh, naturally lead to a kind of... Uh, you know, a warped uh, apprehension of other people's ideas, depending on where they are in your social and political sphere and so on. Uh, but that's part of what's going on here. It seems to be have gotten worse and worse. And, you know, when I said to you originally in that email that I wanted to talk about the extent to which some of this stuff is is moral, a moral or spiritual challenge. That's one of the things I had in mind. Yeah. And do you want to what's your view on all that? Um. Well, the first thing I'd point out is among the the other factors, in addition to the ones that you rightly uh, uh, pointed to, technology, globalization, again, other things, uh, there is the weakening of the political parties historically. Uh, the political parties used to discipline uh, their um, uh, political, uh, their politically ambitious people. Uh, there were smoke-filled rooms. There were lots of problems when the political parties had great strength, but they did play a disciplining role, and they also made it possible for political parties to be broad in their intellectual sweep. So there were liberal as well as conservative Republicans and centrist Republicans. There were conservative as well as liberal Democrats and centrist Democrats. But with the weakening of the political parties over time, you see this most clearly from, say, 1968 to the mid-1990s, and it's, it's, it's now an established fact, the weakening of the parties, they can't play that disciplining role uh, anymore. There's been a significant weakening of the parties. That's, that's a fact. And it's not the only thing, but it's one of the things that helps to account for why now you have this political polarization. The uh, the uh, I, the the uh, liberal Republicans are an endangered species. Uh, we now call them moderate Republicans. You don't even call them liberal Republicans, though they are liberal Republicans. People like Susan Collins uh, from Maine, Olympia uh, Snow, uh, Senator Kirk from out in uh, Illinois. I've forgotten what his first name is. Um, and, and on the Democratic side, uh, I think conservative Democrats are ex extinct, as far as I can tell. I, you know, I don't see any in national uh, politics uh, at all. That, in part, I think has to be written down to the, um, to the um, 
to the parties, to the weakening of the political parties. So, you know, in some ways it was a good thing. Uh, we've gotten rid of the smoke-filled rooms. Uh, there's more democratic responsiveness, but you need to be careful of what you ask for because with that democratic responsiveness really has come this polarization, which to some extent most of us, if not all of us, um, are concerned about. Uh, but let's get to the heart of the question you raise, and that's the moral and spiritual dimension of the problem. Um, humility is a virtue. Intellectual humility is a virtue. Intellectual humility includes and is expressed in the willingness to consider that I might be wrong, to recognize one's own fallibility, and therefore to listen to somebody on the other side and engage them and not just shout at them or exile them to the outer stratosphere. It means being willing not only to teach but to learn from somebody on the other side. This has been the just the beauty and the joy of the work that I've done with uh, Cornell West. Uh, he and I listen to each other. We can exchange arguments, not just shouting at each other uh, or not just him having my say and my having his say. It's genuinely listening to each other, trying to learn from each other, premised on the idea that maybe the other guy's right and I'm wrong. And I won't know that until I've really seriously considered the other guy's argument. And this is what we try to transmit to our students, the importance of that intellectual humility, that openness, that willingness to engage. But look at how that has disappeared from our culture more generally and from our politics. Do you see... You know, Newt Gingrich trying really to listen and learn from Patrick Leahy. Do you see Patrick Leahy trying to listen to and learn from Newt Gingrich? Both of them, just to take a couple of examples, I don't mean to single out those two men, but, you know, what you don't see is any real listening on either side, right? They, they, both men think they've got something to teach the other guy, but nothing to learn from the other guy, at least as far as I can tell. Maybe I'm underestimating them, but that's what I see in our politics. And if not them, if I've made a mistake about those two particular individuals, just think of most politicians on either side. And that, Bob, is a moral and spiritual problem. It's the lack of a virtue, a critical virtue for the maintenance and flourishing of democratic society. That intellectual humility, that willingness to listen, that eagerness to actually engage with a view to learning from the guy who's your interlocutor. Um, I, I, I teach my students not only to argue vigorously, which I think they should, and not only to be people of conviction, which I think they should be. I wouldn't want people not to be. I wouldn't want my students not to be people of conviction. But I stress to them the importance of being your own best critic, of being self-critical, of recognizing your fallibility. It's possible that you're wrong. It's possible that I'm wrong, even about our most cherished, even our identity-forming beliefs. That's the human condition. That's the way we're made. And we got to deal with that. And we deal with it not by sweeping it under the rug or pretending that it's not true, pretending that we're actually infallible. We deal with it by being willing to listen and to learn. I don't know about you, but I've had the experience many times in my life of changing my view based on hearing arguments or considering evidence that I hadn't seen before or grasped the significance of before from people on the other side. When somebody does that for you, that person's not your enemy. Your debating partner, no matter how fiercely you debated each other, that person's not your enemy. That's your best friend. If that person has helped to move you from error to truth or from a more deficient understanding to a richer, deeper, better understanding, what greater gift could somebody confer on you than that? But to get that gift, you have to be open to the possibility of changing. And to confer that gift, you have to engage the other person as a person, even though you think they're wrong, even about something fundamental, slavery in the 1850s, abortion or something like that today, even if you think the person is really wrong about something terribly important, a fundamental human rights issue, you have to be willing to engage them as people, as persons, as human beings, if you're to confer that benefit on them of trying to move them a little from truth, uh, from error to truth, or at least a greater appreciation of the truth. Let me tell you something else, Bob, on the spiritual moral side that we need to recognize. There's a tendency among us frail, fragile, fallen 
human beings. Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, there's a tendency for us to suppose that if we're right about A, that means we've got to be right about B, C, D, E, and F. And if the other guy's wrong about A, that means he's got to be wrong about B, C, D, E, and F. So if it turns out I'm right about climate change, it's just a mistake for me to think that that means that people who disagree with me about affirmative action or abortion or welfare policy uh, or, uh, or trade, that they've got to be wrong about all that stuff too. Mm -hmm. Most of us are, most of the time, are right about some things and we're wrong about other things. And we mustn't ever fall into the trap that thinking that because we're right on this, that means we can't possibly be wrong on that. Okay. I, I have two more questions. One is possibly uh, an attempt to score a cheap political point from my own uh, ideological <laughs> vantage point. Try me. Try and, me. And then, and then I'll, I'll get to a bigger picture question. It's, uh, are there Republicans who bear some responsibility for the place we're at in the sense that for some time, it seems to me a political stratagem has been to cultivate resentment against uh, so-called cultural elites or going back to Dan Quayle, right? This was a big, uh, a big thing. I mean, on the one hand, I suppose you could say he was couching, uh, he was raising valid issues about values. You, you remember the whole Murphy Brown thing? We need yeah. to go into this. But the uh, about which there have now been two articles by liberal writers with exactly the same title, Dan Quayle was right. About uh, oh, oh, you mean about uh, unwed mothers? Murphy, or? Murphy Brown, yeah. Right, right. okay. I, uh, yeah, uh, Isabel Sawhill, impeccably liberal uh, uh, yeah. sociologist at the impeccably okay. liberal Brookings Institution, publishes an article titled Dan Quayle hmm. uh, was right. It's, well, it's, she she's, turns out to be the second liberal well, sociologist. I, I resent your trying to score a cheap political point <laughs> while, while I'm trying to score a cheap political point. I, let, 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 me, uh, let me stop interfering with your cheap political points <laughs> and allow you to make them. Please, have you no decency? Um, so, uh, the, uh, but at the same time as he raised that, the idea was that the people who hold these values are these quote, cultural elites. I think that was his phrase. And the idea was very much that, and in fact, I think another phrase of his, they have contempt for the values of ordinary Americans or so on and so on. And, you know, it kind of gets back to your experience, uh, with your, uh, high school classmates. Uh, you, they think you've that is got- cheap. <laughs> I, hey, the, the gloves are off at this point. Uh, the, the, but, but, but they think you've gone over to the other side, and they think that's what the other side is, these people yeah. who hold them in contempt. And I, I want to concede there is some validity. What you said is true, that, the, the, that they are one of the groups that it's still – you can still make jokes about incest in West Virginia, right? Right. And, and, uh, and, and that's not deemed politically incorrect in the way that some other kinds of jokes aren't. And I think there's some truth there. At the same time, I'm just asking if, if you don't think that, well, you, you get the question. Yeah, I do get the question. Um, I, I have two things to say that represent opposite tendencies. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, yeah, you're right. People do try to score cheap political points by caricaturing people on the other side. And so people on the left caricature people on the right as being bigots. People on the right caricature people on the left as being, what did George Wallace call them? Pointy-headed intellectuals. Pointy-headed bureaucrats, I think, was his whatever preferred version. All right, so that's, that's tendency one, and there's truth in that. But there's truth, as you yourself just acknowledged, on the, on the other side, and that is, you know what, there is, uh, and again, it's old Nicholas Kristof who's, <laughs> who's admitted it, uh, this is more recently, about three months ago, four months ago, uh, in his New York Times column, that there is a tendency on the left to look at ordinary working class, especially white working class Americans with a kind of contempt and unfairly caricature them as, as, as bigots. And there is a tendency on the right to do uh, the opposite. Now, having said that, um, is, there, is there some bigotry that's there among people on the right? Well, you know, I hate to admit this, but yes. You know, 
I, I don't think it's actually much racial these days. I think that is probably exaggerated. There are still racial issues, but I think that's exaggerated. But look at the animosity toward Muslims. I have pleaded with people on my side to not push our Muslim fellow citizens away. I think it's wrong and stupid, or some people say it's worse than wrong and stupid to drive Muslims who are naturally, from a, from a philosophical perspective, conservative, especially socially conservative, into the hands of the left. Uh, who generally do not have the same respect for religion as people on the right and, and certainly don't have socially conservative views. And what I've said is it's wrong to fear them and to make them afraid of us. But I have not made much progress with my fellow conservatives in advocating for the cause of reaching out to Muslims. So I'm unhappy with people on my own side. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep pushing on this issue. I'm going to keep advocating for the rights uh, not just the rights, but for the dignity of our Muslim neighbors and uh, and and uh, and fellow citizens. And I think the same is true in the opposite direction. It's not just a caricature to say that people uh, on the left, especially uh, those in the uh, upper uh, echelons of um, of uh, uh, culture um, uh, and uh, the economy. Uh, it's it's not just a caricature to say that uh, that they often hold people they regard as their intellectual or moral uh, inferiors in a kind of contempt. I mean, you know, I run into this because you know the circles I travel in. I run into this all the time. People may maybe forget where I come from, um, and uh, they'll say things that that I just find incredibly offensive, uh, as if it was just something that all sensible, reasonable people believed about people in Appalachia or uh, uh, other uh, working class and uh, poor people who are not uh, within protected minority groups about whom you're not allowed to say um, uh, negative, uh, negative things. So, uh, you know, there's truth and error in both directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that kind of does, your, your reference to Muslims does lead to the big picture question I said I would close with. And that is, is this it, so Trump? Yes, he is uh, cultivating tension along ideological and socioeconomic lines, encouraging the idea that that elites uh, hold hold ordinary Americans in contempt. Uh, even though, as you say, there may be uh, you know elements of truth in the indictment, um, but he's also cultivating tension along other lines. Uh, with respect to Muslims, with respect to foreigners, including foreign Muslims, but also including Mexicans and so on. And I guess the question is, to what extent is that the same problem as the cultivation of ideological tension? I mean, you, you oh, refer yeah. to that as a question sure. of ideological or intellectual humility. Uh, what would you, do, if you could just do a quick contrast and compare, and then I know you uh, have an appointment that's imminent and you got to go. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I faulted uh, the left for for some time is um, uh, playing heavy-duty identity politics. I think that's very bad, not only bad in itself, it's very bad for our polity. It's very bad for our political uh, culture. It has worked uh, for the Democrats, and so you know when things work, it's hard to get people to, to not use them to their, uh, to their advantage. Uh, but it's still bad, and it shouldn't be done, and uh, I'm going to continue uh, criticizing people on the left and the Democratic Party for promoting that idea. But what we find in Trump is a guy who's learned to play the game on the other side. He's trying to play a right-wing identity politics uh, game, uh, and he's showing that it can be played. It can be done. Uh, you can appeal to people on the basis of identity. Uh, and their differences from others, their differences from the stranger and so forth. Though, you know, he didn't invent this. He's not the first person to do this. Uh, Richard Nixon is not somebody I would class as a, uh, as a conservative. If you look at, uh, at his expansion of government, his introduction, his introduction at the federal level of, of affirmative action, his wage and price controls, his, all, you know, his judicial appointees. There are lots of reasons to think that Richard Nixon, whatever he was, was not a conservative. He was an anti-communist, but he was not a conservative. But Richard Nixon, with his Southern strategy, uh, is a precursor of this kind of identity politics outside of the outside of the left. So Trump didn't invent it, uh, but it's bad. 
Uh, it's bad when Trump does it. It's bad when the left does it. So what I want to do is just try to break this thing. I want to try to push people on my own side uh, and pressure people on the other side to get away from uh, from the identity uh, politics thing. And, and let's keep our focus on reasonable, responsible differences of opinion about how to move our society forward, to lift up uh, the downtrodden, to protect our uh, national uh, security, debates that are on the issues and do not appeal to tribalism uh, and, uh, and identity. There's a perfectly legitimate debate about, for example, uh, whether we should have a minimum wage or if so, at what level the minimum wage should, should it be? Eleven dollars and seventy-one cents. Should it be fifteen dollars? Should it be twenty-one dollars and and fifty cents? That's a legitimate debate, but that should be a debate that floats completely free of whether somebody is white or black, uh, whether uh, somebody is male or female, any of these other demographic. Uh, characteristics. And we could say the same thing about issues of national security, about social issues, about environmental issues. So one of the things that really worries me now is we have both parties playing the identity politics game, and that's just going to alienate from people from each other. It's going to increasingly fracture our republic. Yuval Levin has written a brilliant, wonderful book called Our Fractured Republic or The Fractured uh, Republic. And I want to put this republic, this fractured republic, back together again. And I want to join hands with anybody who's willing to join hands with me. I don't care if they're Muslim, Christian, Jewish. I don't care if they're black, white, male, female, to put this fractured republic back together again. That doesn't mean we're all going to agree on everything. Mm -hmm. But I don't want our disagreements to be along tribal and ethnic and racial lines. Those disagreements should be the honorable, responsible disagreements that people will have in conditions of freedom about the most desirable policies. Okay. You didn't mention uh, people on the left, in that, but I'm sure you meant to. In term, uh, uh, did enlisting... I forget to mention people on the left? <laughs> Gee, how did I do that? Because I, I just want to say I'm here if you need me. Uh, uh, well, listen, I, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time, especially... Oh, it's my pleasure, Bob. Thank you for having me back again. It's really great to have this conversation. Yeah, there are a lot of threads that we can pick up on in a, in a future conversation. Hope so. I, I hope we'll have a chance. Good. Okay. Take care, Robbie. Thank you. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.